Matthew chapter 6, and we'll be looking at verses 16 through 24, though I, I could go through the whole chapter, but I just don't have the time that I'd like to have. In fact, I'd like to take two Sundays to go through this, but we won't. You know, as I read the scriptures, uh, one thing I do see, especially in the New Testament, and, and you see it in the Old Testament too, is, is that God demands that his followers, that his followers be wholehearted. Whether in the Old Testament with the children of Israel is to seek after one God and one God only and worship him. Or in the New Testament, to be wholehearted after Jesus. Actually, in the New Testament, it's kind of uh, different in that God wants our very heart. He wants a personal relationship with us, and it's to be wholehearted. And so this morning, we're going to talk about fasting, and we're also going to talk about possessions. And the rest of the chapter basically goes along with the possessions, but we've got to hit through fasting first and then hit the possessions. Uh, we are to be disciples who are wholehearted. Now, I looked up the word wholehearted and what it meant. I thought it meant something else, but it was interesting. It means fully or completely sincere or authentic. It's one of the definitions. So God wants us to be sincere. Now, if I were to define it the way that I'd like to define it, and that means wholeheartedly gung-ho for him, 110%, don't stop, you know, don't waste any time on it anywhere else. That, that's how I define it. But it's not always the case, is it? It's not always the case. So I really do like sincere in that I'd love to do that, Lord, you know, but I don't have the time, I don't have the strength, and I can't just do it, and so I'm being authentic before you. And I think, I think God likes that, is just be real before him, and he sees our hearts. <clears throat> and if you had the strength and the ability and the time, you probably would be doing it. So whether it's fasting, whether it's treasures, whatever it is in life, just be authentic with it. It's important that we... Do not set our minds on anything earthly. Now, there's, there's a statement, because what do you mean by that? <laughs> you know, anything earthly? I mean, we live on the earth, as Paul said. We're, we're a part of the world, but you know, we're not supposed to be, we're in the world, but we're not supposed to be a part of the world. And so there's a balance there. I, I really wish that as Jesus went through the Sermon on the Mount, and you probably do too, and when he comes across a, a statement like, uh, <clears throat> make your treasures in heaven, that he would give us a list of, of how we do that, right? And that, wouldn't that be wonderful? But he doesn't do that. He leaves it to us to really search the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation to find that list of, uh, of what is uh, treasures in heaven and then what are earthly treasures that we shouldn't be seeking. And so I'm going to attempt to give you some that I think are some. Uh, they might not be for you, and that's okay. Uh, you pray about it as I share them uh, with you. So let's go ahead and, and look at verses 16 through 18, where we're to literally please God in our fasting. Now, what is fasting? Fasting is a ritual. It's abstaining from food or drink for a predetermined period of time where you are setting yourself aside to really seek the Lord. Uh, it was practiced in, in the Old Testament. It was a, a, a ritual that they would perform on the day of atonement leviticus 23 and it was a day of fasting from food now i say that because throughout the years 30 years now of of serving the lord and 21 or two years of teaching i have come across people who say well fasting isn't always about food you can fast other things like time you can fast uh your material things and and so forth and so I've kind of like okay great if that's what you want to do but when I read the scriptures I, I don't find that anywhere so if someone knows where that's at show it to me because I'd like to see it usually when there's fasting involved it's abstaining from food you know it's usually all every instance it's abstaining from food so it, it's denying the body that food so that you can seek the Lord and fasting does come along with prayer they're always together prayer and fasting two things that that we should be doing as a body of believer and there's many instances where we see individuals fasting in the old testament like moses you remember he fasted for 40 days and then also elijah fasted and then jesus himself fasted for 40 days but after jesus fasted we don't really hear too much about it uh with the disciples and jesus themselves in fact they rarely fasted at all if if not um at all 
Uh, we see the reason why the disciples of Jesus didn't fast at that time that they had a relationship with Jesus. And it's found in Matthew 9, 14 through 15, where John's disciples came to Jesus and said, hey, why is it that the religious leaders, the Pharisees, they fast all the time, but your disciples don't fast? Why is that? And so Jesus gave them the answer. He says, can the friend of a bridegroom mourn as long as a bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. So in other words, my disciples don't fast because I'm with them. I'm here now. Uh, I am their, their groom. They are the bride. And so why would you fast while the groom's you know, in your presence? But there will be a time where I will be gone, and then they will fast. And that is in the New Testament, the book of Acts, where you do find the disciples uh, taking time to pray and fast, to seek the mind of the Lord, to seek direction. Interesting that, that Jesus said here uh, concerning fasting that it was mourning. You know, it was a time of mourning and seeking the Lord. <clears throat> so Jesus himself didn't appoint a time, a, a specific length of time or a season that you should fast or some sort of celebration. I think he left that up to us and our desire. I know that I have fasted um, periodically from time to time. It's been at least a couple of years since I, I, I went on a great fast. We had a fast here at the church for one whole week. And we asked everybody to fast every day for seven days. And we met every night and we just sought the Lord. And boy, God worked. God worked a great work at that time. In fact, there was a prophecy, kind of a strange one, so I don't mean to scare you off or anything. But the Lord had spoken to me and said that half the church was going to be leaving. And, and the Lord just kind of uh, reassured me that that's okay that I'm still God, I still sit on the throne, and I'm just to trust in Him. And so I, I actually told the church that, <laughs> that half of you are leaving. And so within, within six months or so, half of them left. And, and we just dwindled down to nothing. And it was so interesting because as soon as they left, the church began to grow and we tripled in size. So I don't know the reason. I can only surmise and, and subject to what the reasons were. Maybe they needed to move on. Maybe I needed to, to let go. Who knows? <clears throat> but those are the type of things that happen when you seek the Lord. I, I remember years ago when I first sought the Lord, and I had been praying and fasting, and I remember uh, laying in my bed and just seeking the Lord, and I was literally like in a trance. I was in the presence of God. I didn't see God, didn't see heaven, at least that'd be a sin, but I mean, I was in the presence, and it was just such a peaceful place to be, to deny yourself. Uh, I was at the point where I wasn't hungry anymore, and, and I was just really hungering for God, and, and boy, I need to get back to that uh, from time to time. So something that we should do, Though it's not commanded of us, uh, it can be a work. So you need to be prayerful about it also. The Puritans call it um, soul fattening. Soul fattening, right? Not, not earthly fattening, but soul fattening. It fattens the soul, right, when we fast. Because it, it just fills us with God and his presence. So there's power in fasting uh, for the believer and for this world. So look at verse 16. Moreover, when you fast, so again, Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount, speaking to his disciples, and he is saying, when you fast, in other words, uh, as the fasting is in progress, this is what I'm going to share with you. So like giving, like praying, it was a regular part of the Jewish life. And he says, don't be like the hypocrites. So don't be like the religious leaders when you fast. Uh, don't have the sad continence. Don't disfigure your face. They may appear before men to be fasting. In other words, you're displaying yourself in such a way that they know that you're fasting. And when they see that you're fasting, that you're weeping, that you're, you're wearing sackcloth and you're throwing ashes on you and you're messing up your hair and you're ripping your clothes, they're going to look at you and go, wow, look at that. They're holy. Boy, they must really love God because they're, they're displaying themselves before the Lord. And the Lord says, Surely I say to you, you have your reward. There's your reward right there on the spot. And again, fully. There, there's nothing sent to heaven at all. Don't do it. No, don't do that at all. Don't, don't fast to show people how pious you are. Uh, we met a guy fr uh, Friday, Friday night at the Summerfest. His name was Pious. 
He goes, I have a hard time living up to it. <laughs> I thought, wow. But he was a humble guy. The Lord has just touched his heart. I think he was a bass player. Or, yeah, I think he was a bass player there. Really neat guy. Goes to Chino, Chino Valley there. <sighs> Don't show your piousness to impress men. But Jesus says in verse 17, when you fast, and it's the contrast right here, right? When you fast, not like the religious leaders, but when you fast, he says, anoint your head, wash your face. In other words, take the olive oil and get yourself cleaned up. Make sure that you're presentable, your appearance is normal. Some of you might be fasting here and we don't even know it. And that's what Jesus is saying. Do it in such a way that no one knows what you're doing. But your Father in heaven knows exactly what you are doing. And then he will reward you for that. He says in 18, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place. So he's talking about the Father being in the secret place who will reward you openly. So when you fast, do it in the secret. Don't let anyone know. And when you fast, God will reward you openly. So that means people will see that uh, God is in your life. And it's evidence because the fruit is there, right? Now, I wish he would just give us a little list there of how it's evidence, how he rewards us openly, but he, he doesn't say. So I can only suggest that when you see a man or a woman that's seeking the Lord and, and they're doing these things and no one knows about it, and, and you watch their life and you see how God has blessed them, you go, wow, the Lord is really in their life. Let, let me give you an example of Pastor Chuck Smith. There's a great example right there. And you look at the man and you go, God is in his life. You know that. So you know he's probably fasting. You know he's probably praying. You know he's giving. He's doing all those things because it's evident that the Father is blessing him openly. And boy, he blessed him openly to let everyone know. And yet, Chuck would say, I have no idea why the Lord is doing this, but he is. And it's just his grace it has nothing to do with me. Yeah. And truly, that's how God blesses us with a heart of humility. Well, why do we fast real quick? There are, I think there are three reasons. One is for direction. You know, we want to deny ourselves and just seek the Lord and, and clear our minds and focus on him and reading and praying and then saying, Lord, give me direction. Which direction should I go? Uh, what decision should I make? Uh, where is our life going and, and where is it headed? Give us some goals. Do something, Lord, as we seek you faithfully. So for direction. Secondly, I think also for liberation. It frees us. It teaches us discipline. It teaches us to deny uh, this flesh. Uh, to a certain degree. And so when we come to sin, when we come to those things that are vices and that can take a hold of us, we can learn to deny them, uh, fight against them, uh, the urges of the body and, and literally murder the flesh in a sense, uh, crucify it so that uh, we can be right with the Lord. So liberation and freedom, there's a freedom there with that. But also I think it's a, it's a time for mourning and for growth too in our relationship with God because it does bring us into his presence as we're praying and seeking him and denying ourselves. Some people, though, are so concerned with themselves that even in their worship of God, they seek to draw attention to themselves. Even in their worship to God, they want to draw attention to themselves. I think that's a no-no. Uh, the last three weeks, that's exactly what we've been talking about, drawing attention to ourselves in whatever we do. If we're praying and drawing attention, that's wrong. If we're giving and drawing attention, that's wrong. If we're fasting and drawing attention, that's, that's incorrect. We, we shouldn't draw attention to ourselves. We should do these things in secret. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So our motivation in doing righteous acts that are pure so that God receives the glory for our good works. Now, if we would feed our spirit as much as we feed our flesh, we would be much better off concerning possessions. So the next section here, actually the whole rest of the chapter is about seeking the kingdom of God. Now this is where I have to be careful 
Because my idea of seeking the God can be different than your idea. My idea of seeking the God is here in this church. I think God has established the church, and not necessarily this building, but a gathering place, whether it's in this building or whether it's in a backyard or a home Bible ship fellowship. But I think he's established the church for a good reason, to fellowship one together, to encourage one another, but then to work in the kingdom of God. And he has done that for the last 2,000 years. Since the early church, Acts chapter 2, when they went out and began the church and home Bible studies back then. And before that, what did they do? They met in the synagogues. They gathered together the Jews. Uh, they created a, a religious system of 12 men. And if there were 12 men, you created a synagogue. And you had a leader and you read the scriptures in the Old Testament. All the way back to Babylon. What did they do before that? They met in the temple the temple of the Lord with priests and Levites and giving and all those things that we do today. And what did they do before the temple? They met in a portable tabernacle. That's where they met and they did everything. In fact, they were all s surrounded that tabernacle. All the different tribes, that tabernacle. What did they do before that? They were in the presence of God, <laughs> Adam and Eve. So I, I really do believe that church is a place where God wants us to be participate and actively that doesn't mean that you can't have a ministry outside of church I'm not saying that I think that that is possible and there are many that do have ministries outside of church and they are glorifying God and they're serving in the kingdom of God so there are definitely exceptions to that rule but again like I said my heart is to build his church secondly 19 through 24 which we'll look at He's going to talk about actual possessions, treasures, what we treasure, what is important to us. And then also in 19 through 21, which we'll get into in a minute here, he's going to talk about us saving up treasures in heaven, sending our rewards to heaven and not uh, using them here on this earth, taking advantage of them here on this earth. For instance, like a retirement plan. You save, 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 and when you're 65, then you start to use it and spend it because you travel to Paris and to Spain and all over the place, and now it's gone. So that's using your treasures here on this earth. But what does it mean to have treasures in heaven? Luke gives us a parallel verses to this in Luke chapter 12, verses 21 and then 32 through 34, if you want to look at it later. But these scriptures, I think, really do tithe into, tie into verse 24, when he talks about mammon and God, and how no one can serve two masters. This is so important, especially in the Greek, because you cannot serve two masters. It is in possible to serve two masters and that's why I said that it's possible for someone to have a ministry outside but it's hard for that person to have a ministry outside and have a ministry at the church too it's just hard to have two going at the same time you know it's hard enough having a relationship with your wife and then working at the same time it's hard it's very difficult so you can't serve two masters and we'll talk about that also let's let's look at um, verse 19 as the rest of this chapter teaches us on how to use our, our wealth in the right way or our treasures that will be uh, heaven bound. And, and treasures aren't necessarily money. This is not a money lesson, though it does entail money, cars, homes, anything that hinders our walk with the Lord. Anything that hinders our walk with the Lord can become a treasure. Sports can become a treasure. So Jesus wants us to realize that material things are really temporal and really have no value. It is the spiritual things that have eternal value in heaven. So let's look at verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Spurgeon said, in heaven, we are going. Let us send our treasures before us. And so there's a way to work on earth so that we can send our rewards to heaven. We're not to put so much time and effort in laying up treasures on this earth, is what Jesus is saying. We need to have a balanced life. We need to be good stewards of what God has given to us and entrusted to us. We should not make them the object of our affection. Jesus is the object of our affection. Now, how do I know if I'm laying up treasures on earth? 
let that treasure be taken away from you and see how you react. That's how you know. Years ago, my wife and I were challenged with this. We were working out at 24 hour, at the time it was family fitness. And we came out to go home. And you've, some of you have heard this story. And we had purchased a brand new, um, oh, what was it called? What was it? Grand Prix. It was beautiful. Oh, first new car, but it wasn't new. And, and so we went out to get in the car and it was gone. Someone stole it. I guess in high demand. And so immediately we thought it was a friend and we, uh, it was joking with us, but we couldn't figure out how he could get the keys. But uh, Gary Bailey was known for that sometimes. And so, <laughs> so we thought it was him, called him. He's like, no, it wasn't me. So we realized that someone had stolen it. But it was interesting. Our reaction was, well, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. It's the Lord's car, not mine. And so we learned a lesson there that God had been working in us to just hold on to things very lightly because uh, they're his. <laughs> they're his, not, not ours. Um, and he does that. He does that with us. He teaches us those lessons because he loves us. And I think about the mobile unit. It's been, we've been praying for that unit for years. You know, and, and it's been teaching us patience. Some people more patience than other people because they've been wanting it so badly. But see, you know, and you, you ask yourself, well, why didn't God give it to us back then? He could have. Yes, he could have. But there are a lot of people that needed to learn patience. And so he waited, including me. And his timing is perfect. And he brings it at a point where we've learned patience and now we give him glory for it. Now we need to have patience to get it, get it set and to get it cleaned up. And I want it to, to be the best looking classrooms for the kids. I want to I you know, spare no expense on it and make it look very, very nice and homey that they want to be in that, that place. I really do. That's my heart. So God is working in our lives, but we're to hold on to these things very lightly. Why? Because he said moth and rust destroy and even thieves break in and steal. They're very temporal. They're very temporal. My in and out t-shirt that cost me $9 is not eternal. It gets holes, you know, and then I'm like, oh, I got to buy another one. You know, they're very temporal. I know a lot of sports equipment that's in backyards rusting away. And people put a lot of money into sports equipment, cars, all kinds of stuff that can become treasures. He goes on and says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So there's a difference there. We are not to lay up treasures on the earth. We're to store them in heaven. We're to send them to the vault up there. I think there's going to be a, a, a vault that's probably the size of one of the pearly gates. And he's going to open it up and your name's going to be in one of those drawers and all of your works will be there somehow. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. I'm just assuming that. I'm sure God's going to know exactly what we have done. What kind of treasures can we lay up? And here's where I wish God would have given us a list, right? You know, I mean, can we send some money up there? You know, Western Union and, and sent, well, kind of when you tithe. And that's a way of, of doing it. If you tithe secretly and no one knows about it and, you know, and so forth. But if you let everyone know that you're a tither and, you know, the, you're the one that blessed us with this and that, you know, then there's your reward on earth. But it's in heaven because you have it. We can't take a U-Haul, you know, to, with us to heaven. Some would love that. Bury me right next to my U-Haul. Not speaking of his wife either. And so it reminds me of a story of old Cyrus Baker, you know, was the richest man in the town. And the villagers uh, <clears throat> were questioning how rich he was. Well, he got very ill and he ended up passing away. So one of the busybodies went to the lawyer and said, so how much did he leave? And the lawyer looked at him, well, he left everything. He left everything, didn't take anything at all with him, you know. And so we can't take it with us, right? Right? Because earthly things rot. But heavenly things, Jesus said, neither rot, mal, um, moth or rust destroy or where thieves do not break in and steal. In heaven, it's, there's no deterioration, no corruption whatsoever at all. <clears throat> A lot of you don't, don't know this, but um, the church was broken into several weeks ago. And um, they stole about $800 worth of petty cash from uh, the church here. Even the resources that we use for God's kingdom doesn't last. <laughs> Thieves come in and, and they can steal. 
those things. It's funny because I kind of spread the word into the community here. There's kids that just roam the street and we, we know them. And so we just wanted to see if, if they heard of anything. And it turned out that as they were here and I had them pull, up, pull into the driveway with me, about four or five of them, and I'm talking with them. And it turns out that their grandmother and grandfather had a little business uh, for their their home and they had a little box and they went in real quick and it was stolen with $700 or so of, of their money. And so someone's going around and, and possibly doing this. But I thought it was so interesting that one of the little kids, he was probably nine or 10, he said, why would someone steal from God? Don't they know how bad that is? You know? I'm like, yeah, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. So thieves come in and they, they, they rob in this earth. But in heaven, there are no thieves. I, I can only picture that. Someone trying to, to steal and God's like, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> you are everywhere, yeah. You, I'm everywhere. Plus, where are you going with that? We're all in heaven. <laughs> Jesus goes on and says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That word your is singular. So it is a personal application to all of us. Where your so here's the challenge. Where's your treasure? So Jesus said, where your treasure is, there's your heart. The heart must be, or the heart must and will go in the direction of what you make important. What you make important, your heart will follow that place. That became real to me years ago when I thought about this scripture. Back in 1976, I had a passion for running. I love running, it, all the way from junior high. And so I would run cross country in junior high, then I got into high school and I ran cross country in, in ninth grade. I ran all the way through, through 12th, I believe. But I had this great passion. I would run on, on, the, on my own time. I'd run in the mornings, run in the evenings, whenever I had the opportunity. In fact, I loved it so much, I, I was running all the way until about uh, the age of 44, and I couldn't run no more. My body said, sorry, you're old. It doesn't work. <laughs> so I had to take up alternatives. So that's how much I, I loved running. Well, back in 1977, I met this beautiful little blonde girl. And my treasure changed like that. Her name is Virginia, and I married her. I mean, my passion went from running to Virginia, where, where now it was, oh, coach, sorry, I, I can't practice. I got to go spend some time with Virginia. You know, oh, sorry, coach, I, I, I missed that meet because I got to go spend some time with Virginia. You know, and then my time on my own, you know, I didn't have time on my own because I was with Virginia. And so it just changed completely. What Jesus is saying is whatever is your treasure, your heart's right there. It will reveal your heart, where your heart and your thoughts really are. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life, Proverbs 4.23. The issues of life. If we examine our treasures, we'll find out whether our hearts are in spiritual things or earthly things. Now, here's that list again that I wish we had. Well, what do you mean? Again, do you hold on to anything? Having a car is not necessarily a earthly thing or heavenly thing. It could be one or the other, right? As I mentioned to you, that car was ours. It, it was our first one, but we held on to it lightly. So... We were willing to let it go. I have a. I just got a car. I'm going to mention it. The Lord blessed me with a with a new car, and it's exactly what I've always wanted since they came out. But I never thought I would have, and and um, I was just blown away that God actually provided for it. Um, you know, my PT Cruiser got wrecked. I mean, it was totaled. So I've been looking for a vehicle. And Rosalind's cousin was selling. Cousin's fiance was selling a vehicle. And it turns out it was a Camaro, black, convertible. And I've always wanted a Camaro, not necessarily black convertible, but this one happened to be a black convertible. And he didn't use it. Only had 18,000 miles on it. It's 2011. And so it's got low mileage, 2011, what, four, five, four years old, five years old. And so it was like a perfect deal, 15,000, you know, with the, PT money and so forth. So I thought, you can't pass that up. If it was a Honda, I would have I bought it too. It just happened to be a Camaro, Camaro. Now, when I 
had that opportunity, believe me, I really got scared. I'm like, okay, Lord, Susan knows. I was asking everyone, should I, should I not? Because I was really concerned. And my wife's like, yes, you've been wanting one. The Lord gives you the opportunity, take it. And I'm like, I don't deserve it. And I was like, what are people going to say? And, you know, all of this stuff. Then I start seeing pastors driving in their Camaros. And <laughs> <laughs> so, so here's the thing. It can become an earthly treasure or it can become a heavenly one because I'm really appreciative that God would give that to us. And, and I'm going to keep it there. If he wants to take it away, it's his to take away and to use for his glory. I don't want it to be an earthly treasure. So just because it is an earthly item, it doesn't have to necessarily be an earthly item, right? It can be a heavenly reward also from the Lord. We're not to put our trust and security in our earthly possessions. Hold on to them very lightly. But we're to trust God for all our provisions. We're to trust him with everything, our whole life, including our money, including our money. You know, giving is God's way of raising his children. I really believe that. Again, I believe the word of God and I want to live it. I remember teaching my kids that. When we would give them any money or birthday money, first thing, 10% cents the Lord's. Put it aside, you put it in the box. And we drilled that into them because it's God's. Malachi is very clear, right? We all know that. I mean, I don't know a Christian who doesn't know that, that you're robbing God. You're robbing God if, if you don't give him your 10%. By the way, robbing, stealing. That little boy, isn't that interesting? He said, you're stealing from God. Why would you do that? Then I thought, Malachi, we as Christians are stealing from God because we're not tithing. Oh, man, I just put a big weight on everyone's shoulder right there. It's kind of like abortion, right? We think of murderers and what they've done to people, the terrorists, and we go, oh. But then we think of abortion. Oh, let's, I don't want to think about that. You know? let's, that let's not do much. I don't know if you knew this, but they were picketing down in Riverside County. A bunch of Christians with picket signs. Close down plant parenthood. I mean, these are the things we need to get involved. There's another opportunity where we can get involved with petitions and so forth. I have to look into it. But my point is this. When we see some injustice, we go, yeah. But then when we see something that we should be doing spiritually, and we're like, oh, let's just not be authentic here. Let's not deal with this because... Hey, I totally know. I have a family. I have kids. I have bills. I have this and that. I can't even eat. So I totally know it's hard to, to give to God. I, I, I get that completely. I know when I first got saved that um, I read that scripture and I thought, I got to give 10%. So I gave 10% from the day one. I was just, I wanted to do what the word said. But there came a point where I couldn't do it anymore because I exhausted my savings. So I wasn't accustomed to it. So I just got on my face and said, Lord, I'm sorry. I'll pay you interest on this because I know the Old Testament talks about interest on top of it. And so um, uh, this is what I can afford, 4%. And every year when you give me a raise or whatever you give me, I'll add to that. And I finally got up to 10%. There was a time where I was over 10%. And then on top of that, and I'll speak of others in this church that support and give to this church, is I love their hearts and they give above that. They give above that. When there's food to be bought or cans of soda to be bought or other things to be bought, they buy it of their own money. And this is a changed heart. This is authentic. Hearts that love God and want to support God. And it's God's way of raising us, right? Because really, the bottom line, the issue is trust. Can God take care of me? Can he really take care of me? Will he meet my needs if all of a sudden I give and it's beyond what I can give? Didn't David say that I'd rather give so that it hurt me, so it was a sacrifice, so I felt it? Now that's giving. Of course, you can't outgive God. We talk about that. I mean, God doesn't need our money. He doesn't need it at all. He owns heaven. He owns the earth. In fact, money is nothing to God. When we get to heaven, the streets are what? Paved with gold. <laughs> It's like there's no need for, for money, so that's nothing. I think the key is this, is that God wants us to trust him and to know that he wants to work in our lives and that he will meet our every need. And Virginia and I have, have experienced that over and over and over again. God has always been faithful to, to watch out over us. 
And I'm not going to say because we have been faithful to tithe or to give. No, because that's our obligation. That's his money, not mine. No, it, it's because God is gracious. God is gracious to us. <clears throat> our motive can be such, though, that it, when we do give, that we want God to give us back. So if we give 10%, will you give us tenfold back? If we give more, we give a hundredfold, you know, and so forth and so forth, Lord. No, I tell you what, I will meet your needs. I will take care of you. I will do abundantly more than ever you can ask or imagine if you just trust in me. We miss the point if we don't get that. It's about commitment. It's about his kingdom. It's about love. It's about appreciation for his grace and his mercy in our life. That's why we give. Obedience to his word and even trust in his provision. You trust in your husband to provide for you, right? Don't you? You really do. Those of you that are married, get to work. <laughs> You're not going to be late again. <laughs> you put food on the table. You know, I'm expecting you to put some overtime in and, and, and so forth. Well, if you expect your husband to do that or your wife, because we live in that day, if you, to wife to do that, then expect God to meet your needs. He can. There's a scripture that says he owns uh, a thousand cattle, on a, or all the cattle on a thousand hills. There we go. He owns everything. The whole earth is his footstool. So, Now, what's the problem? Well, it's, it's, it's our hearts. Look at verse 22 to 23. Lust for material things, the lamp of the body. Light and darkness are used as metaphors here for one's spiritual condition. The eye, you, the eye is used as a conduit of lust. Our eyes are, in a sense, window panes uh, that, that show outside our very heart that's inside. If the glass which, which we look through is dirty, then that means our hearts are dirty. But if the glass is clear, then we have pure motives. You know, I, I wear glasses and I know when they're dirty. You just sense a smudge on there. And so you got to pull them off and you got to get them clean in order to see right. Well, our eye is that lens that reveals our hearts. And when we're viewing something, that becomes our treasure. It's because that's what's in our hearts. And so our hearts follow after that. So he said, the lamp of the body is the eye. It illuminates. Therefore, your eye, if your eye is good, if your eye is good. Now, it's interesting. The word good there is not saying good. What it's saying in, the, in Hebrew, generous or liberal. That's what the word is in Hebrew generous or liberal if, if you're generous with your possessions if you're generous with your material things then you're good then your whole body will be full of light because you've got it your heart's in the right place it's authentic it's sincere but if your eye is bad king james says evil your whole body will be full of darkness uh, that really is where where you divide a wall between who is a believer and who isn't you ever wonder if you're a believer? I know when I first got saved, I asked, am I really a believer? Because I keep sinning. I keep messing up. Am I really saved, Lord? See, asking that question, I believe you are a believer because you're concerned about your salvation. Now, if you were not a believer, then there's full darkness in you. You wouldn't care what you see. You wouldn't care what your life was like. You wouldn't care if you were right or wrong. You would just live your life out. That is one that doesn't have the Holy Spirit, and he's denied the Holy Spirit, which is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, revealing Jesus. The word evil here, or bad, here means stingy, unwilling, and even greedy there. Again, we're talking about the context of possessions, material things. And so if your eye is that way, your treasures are other things, then your heart is dark. Jeremiah twenty two seventeen says, But thy eyes and thy heart are not but for thy covetousness. So I think that that qualifies what I'm saying here. Your heart and your eye go together and it reveals your covetousness. Are you covetousness for earthly things or are you covetous for heavenly things? What do you covet? What do you covet? Spurgeon said the motive is the eye of the soul. Proverbs 28, 22, a man with an evil eye hasten after riches doesn't matter if you're a wealthy individual, you can have an evil heart because you're seeking those riches. Or you can have a good heart because you know how to use those riches properly because you give it unto the Lord and you're a generous person. Or you can be poor and you're still seeking after riches. You could be picking up a thousand cans and your goal is to pick up 2,000 cans so you can be rich one day. 
but your heart could still be dark. Or it could be generous. Uh, you've probably seen some of those videos where homeless men are taking, ap- taking care of homeless men. There's this one video where this kid is out there in, the, in New York City cold, and, and he's like freezing. He's asking for a coat. He's asking for money so he can eat, and everyone's just walking by. Finally, the video shows a homeless man comes over to him, puts his jacket over him, and gives him some comfort and warmth. See, you can be poor and have the right heart. And you can be rich and have the wrong heart or the right heart too. So Timothy says, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and to many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition, even hell itself. Proverbs fifteen twenty seven: he who is greedy for gain troubles his own house. Do you have an evil eye that desires to be rich or greedy or do you have a good eye that desires to use it for God's glory. Paul said in 1 Timothy 6, 17, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. We should examine ourselves to determine whether we're generous or stingy. Now let's close with verse 24. And he gets really right down to the issue of idolatry. We can't serve God and riches. And he identifies, we'll notice here, he identifies mammon as a person here. He personifies him. Because God is a person and he says mammon is a person. You can't serve one or the other. You can't serve paper with Washington's picture on it or grants if it's bigger, (laughs) you know, on there. And then God at the same time. So mammon is an an entity here in a sense. In fact, they worshiped him. He was a demonic spirit in the Old Testament and they would sacrifice unto him so that they could be provided for in their lives. One of the pagan gods of the Old Testament times was called Mammon. So let's go ahead and look at verse 24. No one can serve two masters. And that's straight up clear. Uh, You just can't do it. You think you can and you think you are, but you're not. Jesus said, you're either for me or against me. You can't be both. You can't serve mammon and you can't serve God. You are going to serve one or the other. For either he will hate the one or love the other. Now here the word gives the idea of two masters of distinct or opposite characteristics. Totally opposite. And even interests. God and mammon. Which are totally the opposite. He goes on and says, else he will... Be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, he says it again. So you cannot serve money and God at the same time. There isn't enough time, first of all, to serve both. <laughs> the time is short and we need to be serving the Lord. We, we can't be slaves to God and then devote our lives to mammon. Again, just because my heart is church, I, I believe that God wants us to serve. I really, really do. I believe he wanted me to serve from day one. Uh, when I got saved, I immediately said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'll do anything. And so I cleaned toilets. And I brought my kids and we cleaned toilets. And that's where we started. And we did that for years. And then it just continued to grow. I haven't stopped serving the Lord at all. Neither have my boys stopped serving the Lord. And I know there's many of you that are in the same boat because we just have a heart to serve God. Well, we're all called to serve God. You might be saying, but that's your calling. You're a pastor. God put that special. No, no, no. We're all called to serve God. We're all his children. We're all to be active. You know, I'm so grateful for the service of, of those that are helping with the summer fest. And I know that the rest of you probably would too if you had the time to do so and you weren't working or whatever other reasons. But for those guys to come and set up and then come again in the afternoon and then take it down there and then bring it back here in the, af- in, in the evening late at 10, 11 o'clock at night, that's a service. And glory to God for that, that they, they get it. And their rewards will be in heaven when they get there because they are serving the Lord. And many of them, some of them, at least one of them I know, has even taken off work in vacation time just to do that in itself. So that's the heart. I remember a guy that I used to work for. He was actually a seven-day Adventist, and they worship on on Saturdays. And so usually overtime came on Saturdays, right? Not on Sundays. It's rare that you work overtime on Sundays unless it's a huge project. 
In fact, I've never worked on, on Sundays. Worked a lot of Saturdays. But I remember he would not work because it was the day of worship for him. So he'd always say, no, no, no. And, and under the union contract, it, it's almost spelled out that if they ask you to work, you're supposed to work. But there's also, there are also religious employment guarantees that we have against sex and orientation and religious beliefs. And unfortunately, we know that, but I understand totally that we don't want to lose our jobs, so we don't push it. So we continue to work on Sundays. We continue to work on days of worship. <clears throat> you can't do both. You can't do both. You're going to love one or you're going to love, love the other. You know, today Americans are so in debt. They say that 90% um, of their debt is in credit cards. That is 10% is just real money. In fact, if they were to try to pay their debt off, they'd only be able to pay off the 10%. And they'd have to go into bankruptcy. So you can't serve both. You're going to be indebted to one or the other, God or, or mammon. We all know this. Paul wrote it in 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And he goes on and on and on on what we should be seeking, uh, patience, gentleness, and so forth, love, and those things. But it is the love of money, not money, that's the root of all evil. God may bless you with it. In fact, I pray that God bless you with money and resources, but I also pray that God would give you the strength to use it wisely for his glory, that 10% of that would go immediately to him, and that the rest of it would go to meet your needs, but who knows what God would have you to do with it to send rewards into heaven for you. Let me close. <clears throat> I'm going to qualify all this for you. Christianity isn't just an intellectual agreement or a set of beliefs that we have. We don't list everything down and say, okay, we need to follow all this. It, it's a lifestyle. It's a relationship with Jesus. We need to understand that. It's about living it. It's not about coming to church on a Sunday and then go live your life the rest of the week without God. That's religion, that's hypocrisy, and that will send you to perdition, to hell. God wants your heart, and he wants your life. And so it impacts every area of a person's life. Christianity impacts every area. Your outlook at work, your relationship with your spouse, your parenting skills, your, your ministries at church, everything. And everything is done from the perspective of God's word. You know, there are a lot of Christians that think that we shouldn't speak about money from church. That that's a subject that we should stay away from. In fact, a lot of pastors won't even talk about it because they're afraid to offend people and so forth. Well, not this pastor. If, it's, if it comes up, I'm sorry, I'm authentic. <laughs> it's in the word I'm going to say. Say it and just say it as best I can. Um, it's a part of our life, and, and we really need to pray about implementing it in our lifestyle and, and making a habit of it. It's a mindset, and, and it's a relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. <sighs> Ultimately, what the Bible is saying is that we need to be good stewards of what God has given to us, right? whether it's our relationships or whether it's our finances or our possessions, being good stewards. Because I have seen many of people take their possessions and give them to others, uh, the kindness of their heart. And that is a good steward of the Lord. Good stewardship starts with this, though. It starts with you giving your heart to the Lord and then allowing the heart to be fashioned after God's heart through the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, sanctification. And so it starts with you saying, I'm going to surrender myself to the Lord as a good steward and say, Lord, you are my master. I don't want to serve mammon. I want to serve my possessions. I want to do everything authentically before you and let you be my master, Lord, because I know that you will guide me to prosperity, to peace and mercy and grace.